Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our session on cultivating persuasive communication skills. I'm your host, Jody Hammer, Career Services Specialist from the NPCA's Global Reentry Program. And I'm happy to be here to talk to you about this very important skill, what it is, what it isn't, how you can hone your skills, uh, and, and how that you can leverage those to not only benefit you in your job search, but just in your career and in life in general. So it is a really important skill. So I'm excited to, to be here and to talk to you a little bit. Um, I do want to make this as interactive as possible. So I would please ask that you put any of your questions that you have into the chat box so that uh, I can go ahead and, and answer as many of those as possible through the course of this as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Let's talk just briefly on what are persuasive communication skills? What do you think? I, I, I put this question out, out there to you all. If you can dump your answer into the chat, back, chat box if you're interested and willing to answer, what do you think persuasive communication skills are? I'll give you a moment to do that. Open up my chat box so I can be sure to see them. All right. All right, Danielle, I'm going to ask you for a little bit of assistance. Are you seeing anything coming in in the chat box in terms of what people think persuasive communication is? Uh, yeah, there's two things so far. One, okay. um, Amy said, hoping to learn skills to help in my work cultivating individual donors, example, high wealth individuals. Yeah, um, that's Anna great. Said, communicating to be able to get folks on board with point of view. Uh, Taryn said, persuasive communication, delivering a message clearly. And Catherine said, when you have the ability to use a certain channel to communicate, which aids in convincing others of your mission or project. Great. Oh, that's wonderful. Those are all really great um, examples. Persuasive communication, that each one of those is, is spot on, and we'll be talking more about it, right? Whether you're somebody in fundraising, right, which is a really important job, right? It's a really important job for any nonprofit to have people who are good at persuasive communication skills to be able to you know, get donors to sign on more, whether it's in writing and, you know, verbally in presentations, all of that is really important, right? But just getting people to get on board with maybe a decision you've made, right? Your, um, you know, someone mentioned, I think, you know, in the, in the workplace, that also can be in the, in the personal space, right? Family, you have children and you want to get them on board with a certain decision. So trying to, trust me, persuasive communication skills are very important and don't always work, but, uh, but it's important in family life as much as it is in your career. So absolutely getting people to uh, adopt or, or, or get on board with what you're saying with your, your point of view um, is, is absolutely important. So wonderful. So what persuasive skills are not, I want to spend a moment on this because many people mistake persuasive communication skills for the like what you think of as your, you know, um, salesperson and, and salespersons are not all like this, right? This this graphic that I have here that, hey, sign up, you know, sell your soul. I'm here to give you the best, whatever, um, you know, that's, that's not um those, those, that is definitely a salesperson, but persuasive communication skills are not, when I'm talking about them here, A, they're not just for sales. So whether you're a salesperson and you're doing a great job in it and, you know, you're not at all like this graphic, you know, person, you know, depicts, um, it's also for, as you all brought out already, right? When you're, you know, whether it's in your, in your company, you know, making a presentation, whether it's getting those donors, you know, to commit to the cause that you're, you know, standing behind, which is a great cause and, and all of that. So, so it's, it's not just for sales, it's for every aspect of our life, I guess is my point there. It's also not solely self-seeking. I think a lot of people have a hard time with trying to become more like better, a better, uh, better in persuasive communication because they think that they're going to be pushy or that they're going to, uh, that it's just for them, that they're just trying to, you know, get their own gain, sell that extra item and get more money. Well, the reality, you know, of the situation is, you know, sales and persuasive communication skills 
are really important for so many different areas. And as I was saying in work, you know, think of nonprofits, you've got to have good fundraisers to help bring in the money that helps enable whatever amazing work is being done. And, and you, you know, might be part of an organization that you truly believe in and, and the cause and all of that, you can't operate without any money. We all know that. So it's definitely many times persuasive communication skills are used for the betterment of others. And I would say that your uh, Peace Corps volunteers, I think in, in general, tend to be folks that, you know, use that persuasive communication. They hone that skill or cultivate it, and then they apply it in so many great, amazing ways to be able to um, you know, to to make a difference and, and help whatever organization, right? But also it can, it does help you, right? Certainly by being persuasive, we're going to talk about how to be persuasive, what kinds of words to use, body language, all of that as well, um, because it does benefit you as well, not just in gaining the money for whatever for, you know, an organization you believe in, but also what what about the whole job search, you know, you, I hope, are harnessing, or maybe many of you are here to harness your, you know, like, and, and, and cultivate your persuasive skills so that you can do a better job in your applications, in your, you know, interview, you know, and, and really drawing them in and convincing them that you're the best candidate for this position. That's persuasion. That's absolutely what it comes down to, right? Or even in your cover letter. You know, how can you use certain words and really make it um, compelling so that it really shows out that they should give you an interview at which time they can then further evaluate you. So there's lots of areas that that the persuasion and persuasive skills um, are applicable to and, and persuasion just when you say it oftentimes it has that negative context, but it actually it's very important and it shouldn't be disingenuous right. Uh, it, it should come from, you know, when, when you come from the heart, come from, you know, the, the center, you know, why this is important, you're showing why it's important. You're not just, um, you're not lying, you know, you're not, you're not being disingenuous, you're coming from your true self. And, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit as well. So great. So we have, uh, I have a little bit right here just on, you know, something, you know, one way to describe, right, persuasive communication skills, and there's lots of ways to describe it, but the ability to convince others of your opinion, or at least to um, consider your idea, right? They don't always automatically jump on and say, oh, yep, you've done this, this, you've convinced me I'm on board. They might have to think about it, but you want to at least be able to convince them that your ideas and your, you know, your thought process is valid and that you deserve, that idea deserves more consideration. Other times it can be a product or your, you know, position that you're making. Maybe you're in an organization and you're trying to, you know, there's there's an alternative, they're, they're thinking about alternative workspace situations and you are representing your department on what your department wants, right? So it's, it's those kinds of things. All of that deals with persuasive communication skills, okay? And it includes both your verbal and your nonverbal. And that's really important. We're going to talk a little more about the nonverbal part, which is just as important, right? as as the verbal part and it's it's so it comes down to what you say and what you do and both of them matter so that's really what we're talking about today uh danielle i'm just gonna step for a stop for a second and see if there are any questions as you do have questions please put them in my chat box does not want to open today and that's okay danielle is in back and and helping with that but uh danielle just know that uh if if people do have questions and i'm talking about a concept that's related to it certainly feel free to uh stop me okay all right, there's nothing in the chat box at the okay. moment. Great, great. I'm going to show you a couple of graphics because there are a lot of different graphics on, you know, persuasive and verbal communication skills and all of that. But a couple of the tips, right? I liked how in this one that was, you know, in a slide share that I'd found that, um, you know, the how to, you know, knowing how to, you know, that everything from acknowledging credibility to arguing less. In, and I want to point out with the arguing less, when you are doing persuasive communication, you do not want to get into an argument. Why? Because that shuts the other person down. So you want to remain really open and not, you know, not, not get into the argument, but rather making a point and, and, and even acknowledging maybe if they say, oh, you know, that's an interesting point. You know, I, you know, the, what we found in da, 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 and you go back to it and, and really, you know, so you're open to feedback, right? And open to that dialogue, which is really important. Um, 
some of these that are on here are somewhat related, like offering satisfaction. That is more applicable for a like tangible product that you might be selling, right? Um, so, so that's just important to say as well, though. There's just because this relates to everything, I thought it was important. Um, picking your battles. I mean, if there are really little things, you know, don't don't get hung up on some of those real little things. You know, talking about and keeping, um, getting getting you know conversations back on track. For example, if if they get off into these little you know side uh, side ones, how to you know knowing when to pick your battles. Um, knowing when to shut up. And that is a really good one. And of course, I, I try to teach my daughter to never say shut up. So it's hard for me to say that word. But, but knowing when to step back, to stop, to, you know, disengage from, you know, a conversation or whatever is just as important. It's reading the other person, the other person's body language, right? So much even more sometimes than what they're saying is how they're behaving, how they're acting, what is their, you know, either open or closed body language. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, providing options, right? That's, that's always good. Eye contact is key. And I know I, right now the reality is, you know, with virtual, like you might be doing more of a virtual interview, right? And, and, you know, online, and that's hard because when you're looking at the other people that are in the grid, you know, they have the panel, you're not looking at the camera and when, and it looks to them like this, like you're looking down. You want to really maintain that eye contact as much as you can. I recommend putting a little smiley face right next to the camera, wherever that is on your you know, laptop or the device that you're using, because it will, it helps you focus on that. And it reminds you to smile, not the cheesy smile like this, where you know, you'd keep it all the time, but to, you know, that, that you can smile from your eyes as well. I know for me, I tend to be, for those who've been on many of my you know, other webinars, I can be pretty intense when I'm, you know, doing a, a webinar, right. Or, you know, a podcast or whatever. And, and my, I, I hate having people take pictures of me because when they, they always will get, I'm very expressive. So they get these like weird, you know, really it's, it's just, it's hard. <laughs> so, so um, but for me, when I'm on uh, camera, I can come across, my point is I can come across as very like too intense and, and I'm a fast talker. So I always need to watch that as well. So my tip for you is when you're doing virtual, if you have that little smiley face next to it, uh, to the camera, it just reminds you to look there and it's a little, little easier to do. Uh, to, to make that contact. And then just, you know, the smile that, you know, just trying to smile with your eyes too, and just kind of lighten it, you know, and, and, and that's important so that people can continue to, to follow. So, but when you're in person, right, eye contact as well. And for some people that's really difficult. I get it. And uh, I understand and yet you really do want to look, you, you want to have good eye contact. So some of the things that you can do, I personally feel when I'm in, a, in an interview and it's a, a panel, I actually like a panel better than one person to interview if I'm being interviewed. Why? Because for me, I can address the person that asked the question, but I can also look to the other people if I'm in person with them, right? Briefly to, to make sure that they feel engaged and they're there. And that is really nice on my eyes because it gives me that little break that is so nice versus the staring and not, you know, a blinking that can be intimidating too, right? So you know, work on the eye contact and, and again, putting, you know, something, you know, just, just reminding yourself and even, you know, even just looking at, you know, looking at them for five seconds, I call it the five second eye clasp, right? You may, you know, you're not gonna be counting this when you're answering your questions in an interview, for example, but definitely giving them some eye contact and then a blink, you know, or a blink away and come back, or, you know, you don't want to really look down. You don't want to really look up. I mean, it's, so it's, it's kind of, it can be challenging, but you can get better at it as well. Um, the next one, creating connection, I think is so important, right? I mean, that's that's what it is. Who doesn't want to join somebody who's, you know, you create this connection, the alliance, if you will. You draw people in with that open communication and nonverbals and all of that so that they see you as a part of the team. That's going to increase their ability and their willingness to accept whatever this proposal that, you know, you have is, you know, so, so really think about um, that as well. And then be open and willing to answer objective uh, objections, but not defensively, 
So instead, you might say something like, thank you for that question, or that's a really great question. Let me explain and, and going like that so that you, you let them know that you're open to that. You know, that's, that's what they want as well in general, right? Um, and obviously answering questions that they do have, that, that's inherent. Listening is a big part of persuasive communication skills. And this is one that a lot of people kind of ignore because they get so into the, you know, I've got to persuade them. So what do I need to say? How do I need to say it? What's my nonverbals? And they're all about like me, me, me. What do I need to do to convince them? When in reality, uh, listening is really important, right? Listening for, you know, whatever, you know, questions they might have, objections, right? Listening with your ears and your eyes. Pay attention to their nonverbals. Are they closing their, you know, uh, closing their arms, you know? And that, that's not a very open one. That can be kind of defensive, you know, those kinds of things. So, so listening in that way and being sincere. I mean, you know, again, coming from, hopefully you're coming from a place of sincerely either wanting the job or, you know, marketing a product that you sincerely believe in. I hope you're not having to work in a job where you're marketing something that you don't believe in. That's, that's kind of, that can be difficult, right? A recipe for disaster. If you don't really feel your heart's in it or you don't really feel, you don't believe in the product, it's very hard to make a compelling argument. Um, not impossible, but it's a lot harder. Okay, so those are a couple of the things. And there's one more graphic here with persuasion. I think the components to talk briefly about the components of persuasion, right? So you've got persuasion in the middle, right? And you've got all these different things, right? So there's, you know, effective communication, of course, is huge, right? That's, you know, what we were talking about, the verbal, the nonverbal, all of that, you want to communicate effectively. And, and in order to do that, there's certain words you can say and things you can say and things like that, that can be helpful. But also understanding your audience. So whether it's doing research on the organization, if you're doing a uh, maybe an interview to be able to make sure that you come with, you know, the, the right kind of approach, or it's, you know, understanding a, you know, some market that you're, you know, that you're putting out in a job, maybe that we need to go into this market and here's the research analysis and whatever, and doing a persuasive argument for that, right? Having credibility, your credibility is really key with, with persuasion. So if you are, and, and that's why I always say when, when you come into an organization, right, from the very start, it's really important that you maintain your professionalism, your optimistic type of try to be an optimist. I know it's hard sometimes, but try not to be that like eh, 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 negative, 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 because you will get that reputation. And that's really hard to break. Uh, so, so kind of try to develop that, you know, your credibility of being someone who's trustworthy, who's honest, who, you know, is, is a team player, is a communicator, all of those things you really want. That's going to help you immensely in whether or not you're successful with your persuasion. Um, okay. And then lastly, making a solid case, obviously, and we're going to talk a little more on how to make a solid case and, you know, words you can use, things like that. Um, but those all have to do with uh, persuasion. I really like that graphic that I found on, on SlideShare. So I wanted to share that with you. Jody, we have two questions on yes. the previous two slides. Sure. Uh, the first one is, how does persuasive communication differ when talking with someone who seems open to persuasion versus someone who seems not open to it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, the difference would be in your approach, how you would approach it. Somebody who's open to it either is already on board with you. Maybe they have knowledge of you directly or indirectly and they trust you already, right? So there's that whole element that's already there. So it's a, a much easier one, right? When you have somebody who is, you know, closed down, not open, you know, really verbally and, and, and non-verbally where you're just, you're getting the sense they're, they're not there. You may need to first step back and work a little more on the other aspects or make sure they feel heard. So maybe going and saying, Hey, can you, I'd love to hear a little bit on, you know, your own perspective on this or any questions you might have, like you, you want to make sure that they feel like you want to try to pull them in. Right. It, even though they're, they're kind of exhibiting that, you know, non, you know, that they're, they're not ready, whatever, if they, if they're not, and if they don't in that meeting, now this is different than an interview, of course, 
in, in a, you know, if it's in your workplace, you could certainly maybe approach them later and that might be better. I don't know, knowing the person, you know, you don't necessarily want to put them on the spot and feel attacked or anything like that. So if you're sensing, you know, uh, some, you know, some concern or whatever, I would say, you know, then maybe you, you approach them afterwards, you know, just to say, Hey, I just wanted to follow up with you on, you know, the conversation there and just make sure I, I, I didn't know, you know, I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity if you had anything to share, or, you know, if you might have ideas or thoughts or whatever, I, I'm just making this up. Right. But to, to let them, they might be more comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one sharing, well, I'm just not sure I'm, you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, so that, that's how I would say it would be different. It's, it's more difficult when it's somebody who's not open to it. And that's the challenge, right? Um, sometimes it may be enlisting somebody else in the team who is maybe closer to that person who maybe if they're more on board, you know, they very well might be you know, able and, and will, you know, able to, to help, you know, uh, share or answer questions or things like that from the other person as well. So, okay, good question. And then you said there was another one, I think, is that right? Uh, yeah, there's one more. Um, sure. How can, Thank you, you everyone know, for bringing questions. How can we utilize persuasive communication, verbal and body language during a virtual interview where the computer records a video of you answering the question and the interviewer views the videos later. So you're not actually speaking to another person technically. I did my first interview like this the other day. Oh. I found it very difficult and odd. Yep. Yes, that can be difficult. That's the video interview. And that's what uh, some are moving toward, right? And that, that can be really difficult because there's no person there. What I would recommend for you to do for future ones is if that's the situation, like literally this sounds really corny, I know, but put some picture of a person or just, you know, it doesn't have to be someone, you know, it's maybe someone, maybe better to have just some from a magazine or something where it's a person that's right by the camera so that you're at least talking to a person, right? And, and you feel that more conversational mode. It, it could help you come across as more conversational, right? Now with those, they usually give you a limited number of times you can like re-record, right? Uh, I don't know if, if they did, but usually it's like maybe three times or five times and it has to be a certain period length, you know, and that type of thing. So those can be hard, but the good thing about those is, I don't know if in your case, did they give you the question you went in, like you signed in and they gave you the question there, right? They didn't give it to you in advance. Uh, she said she was not able to re-record at all. Uh, oh, wow. And she couldn't yep. see the questions prior either. Yep. That's a style. I mean, usually you're not going to see the questions before, right? But sometimes they will, right? But um, but in terms of many of them will allow you to re-record like once or twice. So there's a total of three chances, just knowing that this is kind of a different and unique one. But rest assured, the rest of the people who were doing that we're also feeling the same way, right? This is not something that's a really typical one. Uh, I would just say you you need to make your case. And did they give you a, a period of time? Like you have two minutes or was it a set, whatever that set period of time is, they usually give you a few minutes to be crafting like, okay, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to say. Sometimes not. And maybe not in yours, it sounds, but uh, but yeah, you just I, try to make that make it succinct, make it compelling, like in what you're talking about. Um, do you mind sharing what one or two of the questions were? Like what what kind were these? You know, tell us why you're most why you're the best candidate, or I mean, were they tell us about yourself and why you're interested in this position, or behavioral interview questions? If you can put those in, that might help too. Okay, all right. So I'm going to go on and we can come back to that question if there's more. Oh, yay. My chat box finally appeared. Yay. Um, awesome. Okay. So wonderful. So you had two minutes for each question. Yes. Uh-huh. And you tried to prepare questions you thought they would ask. Yep. And they ask unexpected. How do you write your lesson plans? Oh, interesting. This was probably for like a teaching maybe one. Um, yeah, that, that is a unique question, um, especially for more targeted toward probably, you know, teaching, right? Uh, and you have experience in that. And so I'm sure you did a decent job and whatever, I would say one thing that you wanna to do to get better in that is write down the questions that they asked you and then more or less, what did you say? Like, you know, I mean, you could even have your phone recording you for like what you said actually. And then you have a record of what you said and you can look back and, and talk about that. And, oh, how could I have answered this? I could chat with you a little bit on that. Um, if you have, you know, questions and stuff. Absolutely. So good, good questions. All right. 
And let's see here. And finally, of course, I was able to answer, but it was unexpected. Yeah, I was prepared for more questions such as tell us about your international experience. Right. I know. And it's so hard to get um, an idea of like, what are the questions that they might ask? Right. One source for that, just FYI, on a side note before we continue on here. Um, Glassdoor, uh, the, the website, they are a pretty good site to try to get insight on both salary for different organizations, lots of organizations, right? And sometimes even um, questions asked. So think about, you know, checking that out. Not everyone's going to be there. You know, it's not always going to work, but check it out. There might be some information to help you. Okay, great. All right. So tips for persuasive writing. We're going to talk about words first, because as you all know, words have power, as my graphic says, right? Um, words are very powerful or can be, I should say. But too often words can end up being not powerful, right? More kind of eh, eh, not, not very, not really making a compelling argument, right? So you want to make sure, you know, less is more in general, but you obviously want to have enough to describe the situation and, and things like that, right? So, you know, use compelling language. So, you know, and what I mean by that is, you know, like the language that's appropriate for whatever that industry is, right? But if there's, you know, those things that get to the heart, they can sometimes too, you know, wherever, while it might be you know, for me, reflecting back on my Peace Corps service, you know, child survival and nutrition was the area that I worked in, right? That was my, um, that, that was my area. And, and that's more compelling than just nutrition, child nutrition, right? So child survival and nutrition, like really was it's compelling. Like it showed that it was a dire situation, you know, way back when and, and such. Um, including the words so, right? And because, and, and what I mean by that is, when you're writing, right, you want to talk about what's the impact or why is this important, whatever you're saying, whatever you're promoting, whether it's yourself in a cover letter or, you know, your um, position in a case analysis, whatever, in some kind of, you know, uh, proposing for change in, in a work situation, you know, things like that, right? Um, or, as I said, even in home life, if you're thinking about, you know, you're trying to convince in your personal life in some way, you know, kids or not, right? Partner, whoever. Uh, parents to consider maybe moving into an assisted living uh, setting. Many of us who, you know, are more middle-aged now are dealing with, you know, those kinds of things. So it, it can be used in a lot of different areas, right? But we're talking right now more about the writing ones, right? So sometimes it's, you know, writing and, and including the language like so or because, you know, this is an important choice because of the three years of history with XYZ and X percent outcome Get those stats, those facts, those, right? Just like I talk about to people on their resume. I want to hear those numbers. Numbers pop. Numbers and statistics, you know, percentages, they prove what you're saying. So they help you make the case for whatever you're, you're promoting, right? So, so really getting, getting those in there is, is so important, right? Um, now, I know for some of you, for example, people who were evacuated, who came back, you know, and maybe they didn't have a long time in their Peace Corps service, in their Peace Corps site, unfortunately, so they don't feel they have those statistics and outcomes and all of that. What you can still do is, you know, planned, um, implemented and evaluated uh English curriculum for diverse students ranging from K through 12 or for, for, for 200 students ages, right? Like it, it's, you don't have to have that outcome necessarily, but you have the number of people that took advantage of whatever you're talking about, right? Or, or the numbers. So that's really important. Okay. So you want to really, you're proving your position as much as you are sometimes disproving another alternative, whether it's staying the same, or if they're, if someone's considering two different alternatives in your option A and their option B, right? So what questions do you have? I want to stop for a moment on what questions do you have on um, the, you know, persuasive writing, like making a case you know, orally. And there, there's a lot of different examples of persuasive writing. I'm just going to share a couple, you know, when we talk about what is persuasive writing, right? It could be, like I said, the cover letter, the resume, but it could also be, you know, if you're writing an essay or editorial is clearly persuasive, right? An editorial is an opinion, right? You're exerting an opinion. 
Um, debate prep, if you're in, if there's some kind of a you know situation where you're you know doing debates, position papers, all of those kinds of things, and there's so many more, right? So, my question for you is, what other questions do you have about written persuasive communication? If there are any more that are coming up, my chat box is again invisible here, but we will. We will rely on Danielle if there are any that are coming in. Otherwise, I'll keep going and we'll come back in the Q&A. That's fine, too. Uh, yeah, I don't see any at the moment. Okay, that's fine. Thanks, everyone, for your questions so far. I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, <coughs> and I can stay on afterwards a little bit, too, if you need to, if you need to, to chat. Okay, so it's more on the the words, right? Like, And I really like this graphic that was, um, you know, that I had found um you know by entrepreneur and it it's like those 10 words to try to get in to conversations right to to get what you want to to persuade people right i just i love you know and 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 this can be very important too like they're saying here for a salary say you're say you're at your one year and you want to you want to make a case for a salary increase you know and you want to be able to know how can i best make that case you know, uh, for myself of why I deserve a salary. And, and so some of the words that you want to really incorporate in to these kinds of conversations, whatever they are, right? I already said because, right? Because is, I mean, that's, that's the why, right? And, and you got to include the why, right? You, so the, the mistake that people make is making it all about themselves, right? And it's it's really not about, you know, it's don't make it just about you, 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 and, you know, and you're, you know, kind of open that and, and make it, you know, your effectiveness or how you, you know, you're helping the agency and the whatever, you know, talking more about, you know, the agency and 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 making making you not quite the total center of attention, right? Could could is that it, it's more of a, um, it leaves opportunity for possibility, right? So it, you could, right? It, it, it's, it's an openness, like they say here. It, it, it's, you know, could is a possibility. Unlike, you know, won't or never. Try to avoid those kind of words, the, the words that are like shutting down things or, oh, never, ever, won't, you know, um, can't, shouldn't, right? You want to focus on the positive and what can become out of what you're, what you're proposing, right? Together just really shows the teamwork, you know, it's that you are a part of the team and you really want to be seen as that, not as the outlayer. You really want to be a part of that team. And that's important to be seen as such, even in your interview before you have the job, right? So it is, it's really key, you know, cooperating together, you know, open, right? That, that, and I already talked about the no, never, you know, like just remaining open and, and, um, you know, for further, further discussion, further negotiation, things aren't always going to be decided right in that moment, but leaving it open, right? Thanks. Be gracious, regardless of how they reply, respond, you know, um, just that's, that's so important to always keep that, that gracious mentality, right? And I, I talk about this a lot in my interviewing uh, webinars and, and others, many of you have probably heard this, right? Where I talk about even when you don't get that job, one of the best things that you can do is actually to write a thank you for the rejection letter is what I call it. You don't say that, but you write them an email after they've reached out and they've said, you know, thanks, but no thanks in whatever way, you know, great, thanks for your time. You know, we've gone with another candidate, whatever. By, by replying to that and crafting a succinct email that says something like, thank you for letting me know regarding your selection decision for the program manager position. While disappointed to have not been chosen, I wish you the very best with your select candidate. Please keep me in mind for future opportunities as I remain dedicated to, you know, whatever, blah, 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 and am confident my three years of specialized experience that, that, that would be well utilized. Something like that. It's like making a case after the fact, just saying, hey, keep me in mind for later. I, I still would love this. You know, thank you. That's so professional to say thank you in the face of rejection. Most people just are like, oh, darn it. And, and they go on, right? So um, by doing that, the other great way, the other great reason you might want to do that is sometimes that first choice falls out. Maybe they didn't pass the background check. Maybe they changed their mind. Maybe salary negotiation or whatever didn't come through for whatever reason. 
if that happens, I can almost guarantee you when they've had that, you were one of their top, top, top choices if you were in the interview, right? Like that's, you you know, you were one of the top choices. If the other candidate or the other ones fall through, who are they going to look to? You, like, wow, she was so professional. She, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, okay? So, great. All right, uh, let's see here if, yeah, yeah. The, just, I mean, a couple of these, you've probably been able to even read this a little bit, but you know, it, you know, you can you can break that situation down, simplify things, try to keep things fairly simple. Don't lose them with a ton of acronyms that they're not even going to know. For example, we come back from Peace Corps and we have a whole whole world of a dictionary full of you know APCD, CD, you know uh, whatever NC, all, all these different things, right? That that woo, they can be very difficult to understand. So break that down. Don't you know you spell out if you need to, and then the acronym once, then you can use the acronym afterwards, right? So um, we likewise is it, it brings back that teamwork, you know, and that that the, the focus not on you as an individual, but as you as part of the team, you and I as a team. Right. Fact. That's a great one because facts are proof. Right. Facts sell. Facts are what people want to listen to when they make a decision. Right. What are the facts? Tell me the facts. Tell me the outcomes. Right. And then will, right? So if you, you know, if you, I will do that and making sure that whatever you say you'll do, you follow through and you do, okay? That's important. Um, Charity, we have important. a few questions. I'm yeah. not sure if you could see the chat Great. box. Great, I actually can right now. So let me go back here and see, it's just the last two, uh, Karen or Karen, how to deal with someone who constantly interrupts you, even if you're trying to listen and use the right techniques of persuasion. In other words, how do you know the conversation is done over? Yeah, that's a that's a hard one, Karen. Um, now, I guess it would help me a little bit. Is this in a like a boss type of situation, a work situation um, versus like an interview? I presume, right? I mean, it's uh, is what I'm assuming, right? That's that's a really hard one. Um, I, what are you trying to, I guess, uh, convince them of? That will help me to help you. So constantly interrupts you, even if you're trying to listen. And then, you know, yeah, I think there's an answer that might've come in here. Let's see, Karen. No, you know, a uh, work or personal situation, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be a relative or a friend or, right? That's, um, yeah, maybe talking, I was just gonna say political. You get into politics and that's like right there, a it's 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 hard right like it, that that's very hard because people have their people it's almost like they close off to the other side it's more like this is what i believe and it should be <clears throat> i guess i would say in in especially recent years right the politics and and that whole talking politics you know is is really difficult with people that have different opinions with some people that have different opinions let me say some people you can have a really good you know conversation i love talking to certain people who are very different than myself politically but i respect them and they respect me and we have this positive interaction where we hear from their position and some of the things they say might make sense or well you know i, I don't necessarily agree with that but you know everyone has their right to their opinion right and that's what you could be thinking too but when you get somebody who's like either trying to proselytize or, or convince you that, you know, you need to change, that's where it gets, I think, super difficult, right? I will say that sometimes, you know, it, it seems, you know, talking politics, like in, in my family, um, we have had to, like my one brother and myself have very different political views, like extreme. And we just have had to come to the agreement that when we're together, you know, with our family, we are not talking politics. That is just not allowed. It's not a good avenue to go for us because it just gets, it, it, it upsets my, you know, my mom, <laughs> you know, like it's just, we're, we're, we just need to, so we don't. And, 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 you know, you kind of need to know to where to pick your battles. Right. But so professional work situation, if, if you're talking about, and you, I think you put this in here, trying to get the department to adopt a better way of doing something. Oh, I see. So you're probably in that case talking to a supervisor, uh, maybe, and trying to, you know, maybe if that's the case, right, that's harder, right? So um, have you tried to put some things in writing? I'm wondering if, you know, hey, you know, if you were to, you had a conversation, you don't feel like it went as well, maybe afterwards saying, 
you know, hey, I just wanted to follow up on our conversation today. Thank you. Notice what I'm doing, even if it was not a fun conversation, right? Thank you for, you know, what you shared and da 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 I've had some time to reflect a little more on it and have, you know, have a few other questions or I want to raise, you know, raise a few points and, you know, whatever, and then put, you know, put it in writing maybe. And then that can be the background for talking about it. Um, I mean, maybe she takes things in better in writing. I don't know. Um, but that's where I would start if, if that were the, the case. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say about that. Okay. Uh, there was one more question, Danielle, you said. Um, there's a question from Terrence and Catherine, and then Matt asked if these slides will be available afterwards. Um, I can actually make them. Yeah, I, I can share them. What, uh, what we usually do is we put on the, we put them up on the whole presentation is up on the, um, uh, the global reentry playlist of YouTube. And I think, uh, thank you, Danielle. She just put that up there. The webinar is available in whole part. You could certainly, you know, go to whatever part you wanted to see the, you know, just, you know, tag along fast on the bottom. But if you want to see it in a PDF or something, Matt, just shoot me an email instead. Okay. Great. All right. Um, let's see here. So let's go on and just, um, oh, I do the nonverbal. I want to talk about really quickly. Oh, sorry, so, Jody. There's two more questions. Oh, sure. Um, that's fine. Could you talk about show don't tell thinking about cover letters? And then the second question was, do you have any tips for project proposal writing for NGOs? Sure. Okay. So the first one, the cover letters show don't tell. Um, that really is speaking to what we've been talking about, about prove it, prove what you've done, prove what it, right? Like, so, so if they're asking for skills in, you know, whatever it is, right, um, you know, uh, in curriculum development, right, then you want to actually show, right, and show it, not just say I'm excellent at, you know, at, at curriculum development, but rather I have three years of specialized experience as an instructor where I developed, implemented, and evaluated curriculum for blah, 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 right? You're proving it. You're, you're, you know, so it, it, it makes that case. Okay. If that makes sense, that's, that's how I would say for that. For the other part, um, the, do you have tips on, you said, um, proposal writing for NGOs? Is that right? Uh, yes. That was the question. Do you have any tips for project proposal writing for NGOs? Well, I would say all of what we've already been talking about, right? Proposal writing, all of that, that's a whole different kind of um, niche one. And actually that could be, that could be a really good uh, webinar. Why don't you drop me, uh, you can, well, you can either drop me an email and suggest it, but, but when you get, I'm going to follow up with the, the standard after the fact, where I always include the link to, you know, the, the webinars and, and, and some resources for you. And on the bottom, there's always a link that says, you know, insert your questions or topics for themes, right? For, for podcasts here, please do it on that Google survey because that goes right into the like where I have it, where I'm working from. I wanna make sure that these, you know, sessions are applicable, are really what you're wanting and like, you know, proposal development. That's a great one. What I might do for that one is get somebody from, you know, really good in that area to come on and actually share some of their tips and techniques and I can augment it or, you know, whatever. So um, that's how we, yeah, that, that's exactly how we put together what we're, you know, what we're going to uh, be offering is from what you want. So we want to make sure that it's relevant to you. So please do that. And if you have trouble with doing it that way, just shoot me an email. Again, Jody at uh, rpcv.org is the short one. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to the same address as Jody at peacecorpconnect.org, but um, it's a lot easier. Okay, so let's go ahead and... Um, we're almost done here with our slides. I want to just, I wanted to show this one. I think it's a good, it's verbal communication, you know, in the workplace, you know, overall, right? And, and so it's, you know, not just the persuasion, which part of this is like the bottom one, the presenters, you know, and in, in particular, right? But that persuade is one of the aspects, but also to inspire. Like how many of you have worked with a colleague who's just, they're the kind of person that really inspires others to do their best and they just make work more fun, right? That's the kind of person you wanna be, right? Also resolving uh, problems. I did a podcast, my last podcast two days ago, I was uh, talking with uh, ambassador, a former ambassador, uh, Greg Engel, and he was talking about the, um, 
he was talking about there's no problems, only solutions, right? I mean, that mentality. So when you bring a problem up, if there's something that you're facing in your work or wherever, don't just go to your supervisor and say, hey, this is a huge problem. We, this, this, you know, this is broken. This is whatever, right? Don't just go in. Don't be that person. Be the person that goes in and and shares as background what the situation is, what's happening, the, maybe the impact that it's having, the negative impact, and then either an idea you have to solve it or, you know, I'm happy to take this on as a project and work toward, you know, like really looking at how you can be involved in the solution of it. That's going to help you gain an attitude and uh, um, people will see you, a reputation, it will help you gain of being someone who's, you know, a problem solver. You know, someone who's, you know, there in the trenches and wants to help and, you know, is is active and, you know, right, just engaged. So all of those things are really great, right? So, but four different roles. I mean, some of you might be supervisors or have been supervisors, right? So verbal communications, you know, including persuasion skills, especially when you have different viewpoints on your team and you have to come up with one approach. So trying to, you know, address the differences or diffuse a situation if there's tension, right? Um, you know, how, how do you, you know, how do you do that, right? Team members as well, right? It's, you know, that a lot of that is, you know, client work. If, if you are in a kind of organization where your clients are external clients, right? You need to make sure that you are resolving their issues, that you're doing it timely, that you're, you know, respectful in your communications, that you're, you know, right? All of those kinds of things. And then presenters, of course, you know, speaking articulately, you know, and, you know, persuasively, that's what it's all about. And this one's really from The Balance Career, which is one of my favorite sites, actually, um, thebalancecareer.com. They've got really good information on almost every career topic and then some you can imagine. So um, I always I always like to, to spotlight some of that. Um, all righty. And we are at the end. It is Q&A time. And I realize it's after the hour here. I totally understand if people do need to take off. That's absolutely fine. On the other hand, if you have additional questions, I'm happy to stay on and answer those. Um, at this point, if you want, you can also even, you know, unmute and ask me if you'd prefer versus putting it in the chat box. So um, totally fine either way. Uh, there is one question um, asking if you could um, just repeat who said there's no problem. Um, there's no problem. Oh, yeah. only solution. Sure. Sure. There's no problem. Only solution. Yeah. Uh, Greg Enkel, uh, Engel, excuse me, E-N-G-L-E. -E. And he actually just did, as I said, the podcast yesterday. That will be up within probably a week or so. Um, Danielle's working behind the scenes, getting that all together and, and putting the music on it and all of that. And then that will go up on Spotify. You can always look for ours at uh, Jobs with Jody if you do a search go to Spotify or just do Jobs with Jody Spotify and you'll find it. Um, and his is the most recent one. It will go up. It was the one that was recorded on the 24th, just two days ago. Um, and he, he, he has actually a wealth of it's advice for the young professional that he's accumulated from his life from, he started it as a letter to his son that was going out from college and going to get his new first job. And he just kept expanding it and it's like it ended up part of it ended up being part of a book and um the other part he had actually shared with us so um and and said we could share it with with our pcvs so um really good information there maybe i will include that um in uh, in the follow-up as well or i'll, I'll uh, maybe attach that okay if i remember if somebody wants to shoot me a message <laughs> and ask me that's great um, I'm going to go ahead at this point. I'm, I'm happy to take more questions that you have. I'm just going to stop the recording. And that way, if they're, um, you know, if, if you have just do, do people still have some questions? I'm, I'm happy to be on here. Okay, I'm going to just end the recording and then we will continue. Great. Thanks so much and have a great day.